We're going to turn now to the Word of God, and uh, as per usual, if you want to follow the reading uh, with us, just uh, pick up your Bible and uh, read with us. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry, the screens are going to appear on screen anyway. And uh, this morning we're going to be looking at just one verse. Very rarely I preach only just uh, one word. I tend to preach from a bigger section of Scripture. But today we're going to be focusing on just one word and uh, one verse really. Um, Very well known and very, very encouraging one that uh, if you are a Christian or if you've been around Christian circles uh, long enough, you will have heard many, many, many times. And the the verse is this, and it's going to appear right now on screen. It's from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for God. And uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, this verse uh, very closely. We're going to be looking at uh, this verse, uh, uh, you know, in in detail, uh, trying to understand what exactly it says and what it does not say. And together we're going to be exploring the the wonderful reality uh, that uh, is that for all those who love God, their suffering, their challenges, you know, the good and bad and the ugly of their lives is never, ever ever wasted. So, uh, let's really delve into this verse and uh, let's look at, uh, to start with, its context. Um, Again, especially when we are only focusing on one verse, it's really important we understand the the setting in which those words have been spoken for. Really, understanding the context helps us understand half of the significance of uh, the verse that we're going to be focusing on. And The context of chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans really centers around suffering, particularly the words, the sufferings of this present time. And uh, Paul wasn't just uh, referring to a bad period that he was going through at that particular time. He wasn't just referring to uh, a bunch of days or weeks or months or even years that were particularly challenging uh, to him. But with the expression, the suffering of this present time, he was referring to the suffering of this present age. This is the unspecified time between the resurrection and ascension back to the Father of Jesus and his future return. A period of time that Scripture in other places identifies as the last days. That is, the last days of human history before the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom over the whole world and over the nations. And so the suffering that uh, Paul is uh, uh, talking about refers to the general state of brokenness, waywardness, and dysfunctionality of the world and society which we live in. You know, a brokenness, dysfunctionality, and waywardness that started all the way back in the Garden of uh, Eden with uh, uh, the fall of Adam and Eve, but that has continued throughout the ages with the ongoing rejection of God by uh, mankind. And this chapter mentions a number of ways in which we can experience the suffering of this present time. And in this chapter alone are mentioned illness, weakness, persecution, death, tribulations, distress, famine, poverty, dangers, Wars and conflicts, spiritual enemies, human enemies, natural disasters, past and future events. And this is only a handful of ways in which we can actually feel and experience the suffering of this present age. Um, Jesus talked about these things as signs of the last days or as birth pangs evils and sufferings and and, uh, really uh, challenging realities that will only increase in frequency and intensity as we get closer to the end, as we get closer to the return of Jesus, which in itself isn't a brilliant picture if you think about it. It doesn't really leave us much hope. Scripture is, is quite clear in telling us 
you know, there is going to come a bright and uh, an incredible future at the return of Christ. But prior to his return, <laughs> things are just going to go from bad to worse. Things are just going to go, uh, yeah, from, <laughs> from what you're experiencing now and already perceive as bad enough to something that's going to be even, even worse. Uh, but alongside with this uh, revelation, the Bible encourages Christians, encourages believers, encourages uh, anyone that looks up to God during these very difficult and trying times, promises them two promises that uh, will give them the strength and the hope to keep on going right to the very end. And the, f the, the, the first promise refers to the distant future, while the second promise is for us today. Now, the first one is that Christ is coming to bring the suffering of this present time to an end. Not to ease the suffering of this present time, but to squash it all together by crushing the head of evil itself. Something that even the created order, as we read in Romans chapter 8, even the created order waits for with eager Longing, And these, these words are found that we're going to be reading together and they're going to come up on screen right now. For creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So there is a hope for not just mankind but for the whole created order to be restored to its original health <laughs> and to its original prosperity, to the original blessing in which God uh, created it at the very, very beginning. But you might think, well, this is all good and, and awesome and brilliant, you know, but it doesn't really help me with what I'm going through right now. But this is where the second promise comes in, which is what we read at the very beginning of this message, which is we know that for those who love God, all things work together for God. So let me just break down this statement and uh, really zoom into it to understand what it says, what it doesn't say, and, and how exactly the Lord promises hope to us in our everyday living. Now, that statement, that promise starts off with, we know that for those who love God. Okay, so this promise isn't open to everyone. It is not all inclusive. It is actually uh, limited and restricted to those who love God. It is not available to those who join the world in the rebellion against God, but it is only exclusive to those who love him. But not just love him. Again, I, I refer you back to the context of this chapter. You know, the suffering of, the, of, of this present time. So this, this promise is for those who continue, <laughs> go on to loving God despite their present sufferings. And this is quite significant because very often... Suffering and pain and loss are the things that make us point the finger at God. You know, if he's so good, then why is the world in such a mess? You know, why are there uh, horrible realities such as cancer? You know, why is the world in a, in a global pandemic? Why are there so many thousands of people dying of COVID as we, as we speak? Very often we, we come across, well, I personally come across this argument when talking about God with so many people that will put off uh, the God option uh, without even considering it on the basis of the brokenness of the world in which we live in and the evil that seems to be uh, ravaging not just the planet but uh, our lives as well. And, uh, and, you know, very often we make the, 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 the wrong assumption of, you know, not just blaming God for what is going on on planet Earth and for all the evil that's on it, but, uh, you know, assuming that because of that, God is not who he says he is. He's not such a loving God and he's not such a righteous God and he's not such a just God. So the promise isn't for those who buy into that narrative. It's not for those who 
as they face the suffering of this present age, will point the finger at God and say, ah, look, look what you're doing. Look what you're allowing to happen. You know, if you were so good, you would sort all this out. No, the promise is for those who love God and they continue to do so despite the suffering of the present age. Those who continue to love him through thick and thin, irrespective of the season and irrespective of the pain, irrespective of rain or shine. But what does it mean to love God in this way? Because this is a very specific way of loving God. Well, first that is, this is not the kind of love that it's based on feelings. Let's, say, let's face it, you know, feelings are very fleeting. You know, they can be here today and, and gone tomorrow. One of the reasons why so many marriages fail, for example, nowadays is because we base our marriages and our, our commitment to, to our spouse on feelings. And the moment in which those feelings don't seem to be as intense as they were a few years back in different circumstances, that's when the whole thing begins to collapse. Well, the Bible tells us that love, even though it's very emotional and even though it can be experienced in that way quite powerfully, uh, is not just limited to that. The Bible tells us, and we, and we should really uh, listen to what God is saying because the Bible says that God is love. It doesn't just have love. He is love. He is the reality that we're after. And God himself teaches us in his word that uh, love isn't a matter of feelings. Not just a matter of feelings, but love is first and foremost a matter of choice. So what does it mean to love God in the way that we just described? Well, first of all, it means choosing, choosing to keep him first, no matter the pressure. Jesus, talking about the cost of being his disciples, told his potential followers the following words, and they're going to come up on screen right now. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's quite a a powerful statement, isn't it? Jesus was very famous for statements that would just sweep you away and leave you in shock. But with this statement, Jesus reminds his disciples and anyone that was planning on following him that to love him meant giving him the priority over everything and over everyone, including our own selves. And this is something that, uh, you know, if you are married, if you have children in particular, you know, can feel quite a challenging uh, a statement. Um, as, you know, uh, as you're all po- probably aware of, all of you watching us uh, from home, you will know that Last July, I became father for the first time, and I discovered a completely different kind of love. You know, it's a love that isn't in competition with my wife's love, uh, but that is uh, equally, equally strong and e- equally overwhelming as such. All of a sudden, I found myself with having so much more room in my heart <laughs> to love this teeny tiny being that is our daughter, uh, uh, Julia. And um, even on the day that we found out that my wife was pregnant, you know, something shift, it, 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 it was like gravity shifted for me all of a sudden. It was as if in, in just in the blink of an eye, uh, in a split second, I, I, we hadn't met Julia yet. She hadn't been born. She had just been conceived. But all of a sudden, um, yeah, the center of gravity of my life shifted massively uh, toward her. And uh, only recently, I was playing on the floor with her. Uh, Valentina was uh, ha- having a, a business call upstairs, and so I had to entertain little Julia for a bit. And uh, so I was playing with her. I ended up reading something that was printed on her, on her T-shirt. And it says, to the world, I'm one person, but to one person, I am the whole world. And I thought, wow, that's really true. I didn't realize that she had a, an item, a T-shirt, with that written on but as I read it I thought yeah that is that is so true 
And yet, and I say this not in a religious way, not in a hypocritical way, not in a fake way, despite how much I love my wife, despite how much I love my daughter, I love my Savior even more. And you might think that it would be very kind of selfish of God to uh, place such a demand uh, on us, you know, uh, somehow forcing us to take away uh, some of the love for our wife, for our daughters, our sons, you know, our fathers and mothers, whoever it is, you know, to place it upon him, to give him that absolute priority in our hearts. But actually, you know, that again is, 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 is a lie, you know, that is very, very deceitful because actually uh, by loving God first, I end up learning to love my wife better and to love my daughter better. Why? Because like I said earlier, God is love. And not just one kind of love, every kind of love, like the love of a father to a daughter, the love of a husband to, a wife and, to his wife, and, and, and so on. So really, nobody is at a loss. If anything, because I love God first, they will experience my love even better. And, uh, and there, something that really gives me hope in my relationship with my wife is also knowing that my wife loves God more than she loves me and more than she loves our little daughter. And, uh, and so, yeah, this is something that Jesus reminded his disciples right off the bat. Okay, you want to follow me. You've got you, you to you gotta know what's entailed. And that is that whenever there is a conflict of interest between uh, uh, me, between loving me and loving anything or anybody else, I always must come first. And, uh, and that's what, exactly what Jesus reminded to his disciples. If you want to love me, make sure that you love me completely and above everything and everyone else. To love God is to keep him our highest priority, no matter the circumstances and no matter the pressure and let's face it nowadays um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for us um, to uh, walk as disciples of Jesus in this society in a society that seems to be putting censorship and, uh, and bans on all sorts of things that are actually quite crucial to our relationship with God and to our expression, the expression of our Christian life, identity, and faith. And again, Jesus reminds us, irrespective of how illegal it becomes, you know, to believe certain things, how illegal it becomes to say certain things that are actually quite close to my heart. Remember this, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, this was Jesus speaking, <laughs> whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will I be ashamed when I come in my glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So really, if we want, if we want to be people that love God, we need to be people that make a choice to love him completely and above everything and everyone else, irrespective of the circumstances, irrespective of the current culture and irrespective of its pressure but to love God isn't just a, the choice to keep him first but it's a choice to obey him no matter the cost something that's quite connected to something that I have just said Jesus said to his disciples and again the words will appear on screen right now if you love me you will keep my commandments Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Again, really, really powerful words that somehow, very well, it, it, they challenge our understanding of God's love for us. We often talk about God's unconditional love for us when really these words seem to contradict it. It's, they seem to tell us that really God's love toward us is conditional upon our obedience of his word and his will. Not only it says that there isn't such a thing as nominal Christianity where we say we are Christians but we're not really doing what Christ says. Because it goes, it goes on to say if you love me you will keep my commandments and whoever has my commandments keeps them. He it is who loves me. But he also goes on to say that he who loves me 
will be loved by my Father. That is, who loves me by keeping my word and my commandments, he himself will be loved by me, by my Father, and we will manifest ourselves to him. This is, you know, quite, quite radically different from what we may sometimes understand of love dynamics between us and our God. And then last but certainly not least, loving God often boils down to a choice to trust and hope in Him no matter what happens around us. To keep on trust and believing in His goodness even when our life and, and our being may be surrounded by realities that seem on the surface to be negating that truth. And again in the Psalms we read this and the words will appear right now on screen. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in a steadfast love. So the promise starts with this condition for those who love God. That means that the promise to see all things working together for God only applies to those who love God despite their present sufferings. Those who choose to keep him first no matter the pressure, obey his word no matter the cost, trust and hope in his goodness no matter the circumstances. For them, for those who love God, all things work together for God. But what does that mean, that all things work for get, together for good? Let me just uh, break it down for you um, very, very quickly. Let's start off with the, uh, with the item, all things. You know, what is all things? Well, all things is all things. <laughs> it's not just the good things. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that includes the suffering of this present age, whatever they are. Those who love God have the assurance that God can create something good out of their very worst experiences. And as a pastor, as a church leader, this is really what uh, keeps me going on a daily basis. You know, seeing people, no matter how broken, no matter how lost, no matter how damaged uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, Seeing them finding wholeness and complete healing and an, all, an awful lot of good <laughs> as they place all of that rubbish and all of that brokenness and all of that dysfunctionality into the hands of Christ for Him to turn things around completely. Those who love God have that assurance that God can and will create something good out of their very worst experiences. However, this will not happen through transformation, but through mixture. <laughs> uh, here it says that all things work together, okay, for good. And, uh, and to kind of help you understand what I mean, I, I, I'm going to kind of draw your attention to a coffee cake. <laughs> um, coffee cake, amazing cake, I really like it. Uh, if you're European like me, you will uh, love it for breakfast with a nice cup of joe. They will really go well with each other and uh, give you a fantastic start to the day. Uh, whether you don't like having cake in the morning, you know, that's entirely up to you. Nonetheless, co coffee cakes are amazing and they taste so good. Uh, but when you look at their individual ingredients, you may realize that uh, they're not that brilliant when taken and eaten individually. You know, even if you consider something like sugar, yes, it's sweet, it's nice, you know, and uh, I, I'm okay with just a spoon. But if I have to eat a bag of sugar, <laughs> that will definitely make me sick. It will probably cause me diabetes, if not killing me right there on the spot. Uh, what about flour? Again, it's such an incredible thing. But taking of its, in and of itself, try and eat flour on its own, super dry. And uh, really, it will not leave you with a nice experience. And what about coffee? Great, I love coffee. Um, and, uh, but what if uh, you were to uh, <laughs> you know, eat coffee beans as they are? You know, I've, I've done it a couple of times. There's, a, there's, a, there's an Italian drink that actually comes with a grain of coffee. 
uh, in it and uh, you've got to chew it <laughs> at the very end. And let me tell you, it's not nice. It's incredibly, incredibly, not only dry, but incredibly bitter. And uh, as you would expect. So you take these ingredients individually and they may not necessarily be that good. But you put them together in the right amounts and in the right order and in the right way. And you end up with coffee cake, which is fantastic. So this is just a silly illustration to, to show you what it means for God to work all things together for good for those who love him. That is, if you love God no matter... Uh, what, uh, what, you, what your life is made of, okay? what your journey has been characterized by. You know, you could have had sweet seasons and dry seasons and really, really bitter and broken seasons. It doesn't matter how bad those things are. God can take them, put them together, and work them out together for something incredibly, incredibly good, as we're going to see uh, uh, in, a, in, in a couple of moments. And, but you see, God's not even limited by the quantity of ingredients. You might say, well, I can't really make a coffee cake if 90% of my ingredients is coffee and only 10% is, I don't know, flour and I have no sugar. God's not limited by these limiting factors, irrespective of what our life is made of, irrespective of, of how many years of rubbish our life has been characterized by. God can work all things. He can work all things together for good, for those who love him. So do not ever feel discouraged. Do not, do not ever feel like you're a write-off. Okay? There are no write-offs with God. And there are, there are no lives that are too broken or too lost. There, are, there is no sin too great that God cannot not only forgive, but work out together with all things <laughs> for our good. Which leads us to the last portion of that statement, to God, that is for good. Notice how this very verse doesn't say for our own good, but for God. We often kind of miss these little details in the things that we read in the Bible and we just skip over them without stopping and thinking about why did the writer write it this way? Why didn't he say that for those who love God, all things work together for their good or for our good? Why did he say just for good? That's because whereas our God, you know, almost invariably works things out for our good, the promise is not that. The promise, the assurance, okay, the thing, the reality that cannot be denied and cannot be broken is that God will work out all things for good, for those who love him, okay? So it's going to work all things out for good, for the greater good, for the higher good, call it whatever you want, for the good. This means that sometimes the Lord will cause all things to work together for something that may not be perceived as good from our own individual perspective, but that are, however, greatly beneficial from a wider perspective. So let me give you a couple of examples from history and then one from my personal life. Telemachus. This is someone you probably never heard of. <laughs> it's a Latin word. And it was uh, the name of an ascetic Christian monk who lived in the 4th century. He lived in the East and he once went on pilgrimage uh, uh, to Rome. And upon arriving to Rome, he was absolutely shocked and horrified to know that uh, in the Colosseum, uh, there were games taking place that involved two human beings, or in fact, more than two human beings, or gladiators, just slaughtering each other, uh, slaughtering one another in front of a cheering uh, uh, crowd. And uh, as he found himself in the Colosseum witnessing what he was witnessing, he was so uh, indignant, he was so righteously horrified that he ended up uh, walking all the way down and jumping into the arena and standing in between the two gladiators, commanding them to stop. And mind, the emperor himself was sitting there 
and watch it. He was pleading with the crowds, he was pleading with the gladiators, he was pleading with the emperor. He was, it, it just, he was desperate to put that to an end. Well, that didn't really end well for him because upon the emperor's command, uh, one of the gladiators struck him in the belly and he died in front of everyone. However, his death and sincere plea turned not only the hearts of the people, but the heart of the emperor himself, Emperor Honorius, who moved by his sacrifice, later issued an historic ban on gladiator fights. It didn't turn out very well for this one Telemachus, but what it did it certainly worked out for good as this uh, human sacrifice was put to an end on that particular day. What about William Tyndale? If you're a Christian, you probably heard the name. He was a Christian scholar who lived during the reign of King Henry VIII. Uh, he was tried and uh, executed as an heretic, and his heresy being uh, translating scripture, translating the Bible from Latin into English. His heresy was basically taking the word of God and make it available to the common uh, uh, populace. And, uh, um, and, and that did not sit well uh, with uh, the emperor. That did not sit well with the religious establishment of the day. And, uh, and so he was, uh, uh, he, he, was, he was murdered. He was executed. Uh, but before being strangled to death and his body burned at the stake... He cried out these words, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Those were his last words before being strangled to death. And God certainly heard that cry. His sacrifice for the cause of God's kingdom, coupled with that last declaration, that last breath, <laughs> Uh, really issues something prophetically powerful because only two years later, the same king, the same King Henry VIII, had a change of heart and authorized Matthew's Bible that was a, basically a complete edition of Tyndale's work to be placed uh, in uh, every English church. Not only did he legalize it, but he promoted it as the authorized version that we all know today. What about the Apostle Paul himself? Uh, in prison because of the gospel, in prison because of his work of spreading the knowledge of salvation in Jesus. Well, we all know what prison did to him and we all know how his story ends. Um, he was murdered, he, was, he became one of the martyrs of the faith. His only advantage was that being a Roman citizen, um, his death was uh, quick and fairly painless as he got his head chopped off. You know, not so lucky were all, all of his uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, apostles. You know, they were all uh, brutally murdered one way or another. You know, from, uh, uh, from an apostle Peter crucified upside down according to uh, tradition to James, again, executed by uh, the uh, Roman governor Herod just to please the masses. The only one that escaped such death and died of natural death was the Apostle uh, John. But he himself uh, wrote his last letter uh, from a little island while under forced labor, which is now known as the book of Revelation. Well, the Apostle Paul, yes, he was in prison, and yes, eventually he was executed, but out of that imprisonment came all sorts of letters that he wrote to all sorts of churches which now make up the vast majority of our New Testament. It didn't turn out very well for him, just like it didn't turn out very well for Tyndale, but it definitely turned out for God, certainly for our God. And now lastly, and this is more on a more personal uh, from a more personal perspective, uh, recently a very good friend of mine died of COVID. And this guy uh, was, a, was a Christian and uh, there were so many Christians, so many 
churches praying for him. And, uh, and, you know, we were praying, believing. We were praying, believing that God could heal him of COVID and, uh, and take him out of the hospital, uh, uh, make him, you know, able to breathe on his own and, and, and so on. Certainly many prayers have, have gone out to similar cases which made a, a, a miraculous recovery. And yet my friend didn't make it. My friend actually died. And it left me wondering as well, you know, because I'm human as well, you know, and I would be thinking, Lord, with all the prayer that's been going on, you know, how, how come that didn't work? And the Lord made me realize it's not that prayer didn't work, it's just that it wasn't His will. And shortly after that, after a few weeks of speaking uh, to someone who knew Him, we realized that uh, during that ordeal uh, that led Him to His death, that led Him to His passing, not only his daughter, but her husband gave their life to Jesus and as a family are now following the Lord. Something that wouldn't have happened had he been healed, had he <laughs> gotten uh, well. It was uh, precisely that ordeal that brought the whole family together and that b caused some of them to uh, find Jesus for themselves. So in all of these examples, uh, God caused all things to work together, not for the individual's good, but for God, for their God. The three, four of them are now absent from the body, but present with the Lord, awaiting a crown of glory with all those who love God despite their present sufferings. In their case, their suffering brought about uh, an awful lot of good to many others. And that's the thing, for those who love God, their suffering, their pain, their present suffering, or the, the suffering of this present time are really never, never wasted. And so I would like to encourage you uh, this morning. You know, if you love God, keep on loving Him in the way that we talked about only a few moments ago. Keep, keep choosing to keep Him first. Keep choosing to obey Him. Keep choosing to trust and hope in Him, even when what you see with your own eyes seems to suggest, to suggest the exact opposite. For this is a promise that God will never break and that will always come true. For those who love God, all things work together for good. And you will not only receive a reward in the life to come, but you will rest assured that whether you're alive to see it or not, God's gonna do something amazing with it. And for those of you who do not know or love God just yet, let me encourage you, you know, don't waste any more time. Come to know Jesus for yourself. Come to fall in love with love himself. Start a journey with him. Begin to read the Bible for yourself. Begin to pray for yourself. Even if you don't know how, just talk to him. He's going to listen to you just as he listens to me. And uh, if you want to be guided in any way whatsoever, just reach out to us. But yeah, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of life you've led, and no matter what kind of stuff has happened to you, let me encourage you. Don't let... Don't let any of that stop you. You're not a write-off. And God loves you. And He loves you in a way that nobody else could ever match. He gave His life for you, even though we did not deserve it in any way whatsoever. He gave His life that we may have life. He took upon our sins and transgressions and paid the price for them that we may be able to be forgiven. He committed the ultimate self-sacrifice so that we could be in a position where we love Him and He would work all things out, all, uh, work all things together for our good and for the good. So begin to follow Him, begin to search for Him and He will make Himself to be found and your life will be turned around completely. You will not be able to recognize it just, uh, how, but just by how good the Lord is going to be towards you and those around you. So with these words, I just want to invite the worship team back on stage. They're going to lead us into one final song as I pray. 
you will have noticed that Don disappeared. Don't worry, there's not a trap door under there. Uh, <laughs> he just had to rush to Costa for work. I couldn't get out of it. So, but he was able to, to help us at the very beginning. So come on, guys. Come on here. And, uh, and let's sing one final song. Father, I just pray uh, for each person watching us from, from home right now, Lord God. I pray, Father, that... Uh, through this word this morning, not only will they inspire to look forward to the return of your son Jesus, but that they will, oh Father, be inspired to love you and see all things work together for God as they place them into your hand. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.